Well, it is good to have all of you. And before we begin our sermon, we're going to speak from John chapter 10 today. I want to take a moment first to thank those of you who have uh, this week mailed in your offerings and your tithing. And let me encourage those of you with Faith Baptist Church, those of you that are guests or viewers, uh, this isn't meant for you. Uh, if you. If you don't go to Faith Baptist Church, we're not pleading for your money. But for those members of Faith Baptist Church, we do uh, request that you would keep your church funded during this time that we're not meeting together. And you can uh, mail that to our post office box, uh, post office box 374 here in Lagodi. Obviously, the zip is 47553. Okay, well, we do appreciate you once again, and I want to speak today. I know that uh, because of the current events we have, this is awkward for all of us. We're not attending our churches, and so we are committed to bring you a sermon each week. And at last week, we spoke about the four things that Corona could not do. And today, kind of with that theme, we're going to look at uh, a guidance during this period. And I want to look in John chapter 10, where Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. Uh, Jesus made seven I am statements. Uh, the good shepherd, the I am the good shepherd is the fourth of those seven statements. Uh, this is Jesus' 10th recorded sermon found in the Gospels. Uh, Jesus uh, preached, uh, we believe, 34 sermons in the Gospel, and this is the 10th of those 34. Now, I want to talk about the word good. Jesus described himself as the good shepherd. The word good in Greek is kalos, and it actually means noble, wholesome, with inner beauty. Now, the strange thing, if you'd have been on the earth when Jesus walked the earth, uh, most movies and most films you see, Jesus is, is, is fairly attractive. Uh, but uh, Isaiah 53, 2 says, When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we shall desire him. Uh, I don't know what Jesus looked like, obviously, but uh, from this description, uh, there's quite frankly that Jesus would have been a common looking person at best. And yet the Bible describes them as beautiful. But this beauty is inner beauty. And so that, that's what we're going to speak about. But Jesus described himself as a loving and a caring shepherd. Uh, and so uh, Jesus said that it, as a shepherd that he had right to the sheep. And I want you to read verse uh, 1 and 2 with me of, of John 10. Verily, verily, and literally those words mean amen, amen. Jesus, uh, instead of amen in the end of his sermon, amen the beginning of his sermon. Uh, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Uh, but he that enters him by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And so uh, the oriental sheepfold, uh, sheep would have been very common if you would have been in that culture. And the oriental sheepfold consisted of four stone walls with one opening. Uh, there was no roof. There was no need because of the climate of the area. But uh, at the end of each evening, every shepherd would bring his sheep in together. So they, there would be maybe several shepherds sharing the same sheepfold. So not every sheep in the fold belonged to that shepherd. But we're going to find out here in a moment that Jesus does know the sheep that belong to him. And so if you're one of Jesus' sheep, he knows you and knows you well. But if you're not one of Jesus' sheep, i got good news for you because before this sermon is over, we're going to find out that, Jeep is, uh, that Jesus is committed into growing uh, his flock, his herd, if you would. All farmers uh, want to grow their herd. And Jesus is going to grow his herd. Each day, Jesus grows his herd. So, so we see that. Uh, but I want you to uh, pay attention in verse 2. And he says, But he that enters in by the door, or the opening, some, some Bible translations say, he, he's the shepherd of the sheep. You see, a thief can't come in through the door. The thief has to come in some other way. So there's no question when Jesus is calling you and Jesus is speaking to you, you're going to be very aware it's Jesus. Now there's going to be other calls on your life, calls of materialism, uh, calls of, of lust, calls of, of, of flesh. Now you're not always going to be aware 
who it is that's given you those calls. But I can assure you, you're always going to know when the call comes from Jesus. And that's what he's telling us here. But Jesus shared that it is not a herd responsibility. Jesus isn't concerned about all the sheep at the moment. He is focused on a single sheep. Look with me, if you would, in verse 3 and 4. To him, uh, the porter opens. The porter would have been, uh, that night, they would hire somebody to watch all the sheep. All the shepherds would have, would have pitched in, and they'd had a little money, gave it to the gentleman, keep the sheep safe until we're here in the morning. And so that was the porter's job. But obviously, if it's his job, it was his responsibility to only allow the shepherds in. And so Jesus said, he has a right as the shepherd to enter in. And look what he says. And the sheep hear his voice. Now anybody that's ever been around sheep, or anybody that's ever been around, they know that the shepherd calls to the sheep. Now you can call. It said, Jesus went on to say some other voice they wouldn't listen to. You can talk to a shepherd of sheep, and whatever term he uses to call the sheep in, you can repeat that exact term and those exact words, and those sheep at best may look at you. But that shepherd, they have learned his voice. And so it's mine and your uh, privilege, if you would, when we hear the voice of the shepherd to follow the voice. And so how do we learn that voice? Well, obviously there's several steps. I, I don't know if these are exhaustive and I don't know if they're the only steps. But one of the steps would be uh, a scriptural study, a uh, prayer life, a fellowship together. Right now we know that has been interrupted. Uh, my week has is, is just been interrupted. The fact that I can't fellowship uh, with a church body. And so, uh, but, but that is part of the growth process. Uh, but uh, we see here that Jesus tells us in, in John 10 verse 4, And when he put forth his own sheep, he goes before them. The sheep follow, for they know his voice. Now, in our culture, especially in here in rural Indiana, we are very familiar with, uh, with animals on a farm. And, and you can drive cattle into a barn. Uh, you can put a horse in a corral. Uh, you can even uh, uh, put hogs in, in a corner of a pen. But sheep cannot be driven. Sheep refuse to be driven. They, they, don't, they don't understand the concept. And, and if you go in a herd of sheep, all you're going to do is divide that sheep. You're going to spread those sheep. Those sheep cannot be driven. But rest assured, there's one thing that sheep do better than any, any farm animal. And that is follow the shepherd. You see, Jesus isn't driving you and I through this life. Jesus is leading you and I through this life. Well, we're hearing a culture right now, a lot of confusion, and, and I, I can't clear up the confusion. I, I won't uh, uh, clear the muddy waters by wading into them. I'm not sure of the impact of this virus in the future. I'm not sure of uh, uh, many things. But one thing I know is our shepherd will lead us and, and he'll guide us. You know, churches all over America. Uh, have went online. Last week I, I heard one of the uh, pastors say that uh, usually they have uh, about a hundred uh, commitment cards signed up on their online. Last week 2100. Uh, I mean uh, we see all through America. Uh, we appreciate those of you who listened to the sermon that was given here last week and, and, and many people, uh, more people listen to that sermon than, than we ever gather here in the building. And so uh, what we're seeing is Jesus is leading. There's going to be a, something, uh, something advantage to all of us in the end uh, as we follow the shepherd. Uh, uh, but uh, I want you to notice that Jesus calls. He talks. He gets to know. Uh, you know, uh, a stranger would not take time to know your name. Many times, some of you have went to ball games. I've traveled to these major cities and went and watched ball games. And, and they'll tell how they love the fans and, and tell how appreciative they are of fans. But I've never had a team owner come and ask me my name. I've never heard one of those participants of the game stop in the game and say, Oh, you, sir, what's your name? But the God of the universe, the one who makes life possible, knows our name. Uh, how wonderful uh, a description we have. You know, here at Faith Baptist Church, one of the first steps we take 
when we have a visitor is to hand them a card and get to know their name. Uh, when when I, I had visual interest in my wife, uh, I didn't know her name. I went to a friend, asked her name. Uh, you see, I knew what I, the person I was looking at, but I didn't know the person's name. And so any relationship begins with knowing someone's name. And Jesus Christ says he knows our name. He calls us by name. Uh, there's over 7 billion people on this earth, and yet he is involved. Now, let's, let's continue here in, in John 10, if you would. And, and he tells us uh, once again uh, that uh, Jesus is all about caring and nursing for the sheep. Uh, much like the children of Israel. There, there's a, a, in Exodus, the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, uh, the children of Israel wandered in the desert for 40 years. Now, there's some of you listening to me that aren't even 40 years old. Some of you can't, uh, maybe uh, some of you uh, can't imagine working in your job for 40 years. Uh, You know, 40 years seems like a long time. And 40 years is a little bit of length, there's no question. But in those 40 years, uh, every time, every evening they got ready to eat, there was food. Every time they're thirsty, there was water. The Bible says their sandals on their feet lasted for 40 years. Now, I'm accustomed to keeping shoes for a long time, but I have no 40-year-old shoes. Uh, But 40 years of of shoe wear. Why? Because they were guided. But but God uniquely guided them. He gave a cloud during the day. In the desert, the sun's up and it's hot. But they had a cloud to follow. The cloud uh, kept them on a path. All they had to do was look up in the sky and see the cloud and follow the cloud. And then, of course, when it gets dark, you can't see clouds. Well, what happened then? Well, God, being the good shepherd, he provided a pillar of fire, if you would, uh, everywhere they went. Now, at night, we all know at night, you can see a fire. So God led those people for 40 years. I want to tell you, I, I am older than 40 years. And there's many of you listen to me that are older than 40 years. And the good shepherd has led. Not with a cloud, not with a flame, but with a voice. The voice of the shepherd. And, and so, so we see that, uh, you know, he's not some disconnected Godhead. I actually feel sorry for some of the cults and false religions having gods that, uh, it, little gods with, uh, gods with little g. We know they're not deity, but they're actually gods in our mind anyways. And, and they have all these forms of sacrifice and all these things that they imagine that takes to please their God. But our God's not that way. Our God's connected. Our God is the good shepherd. Our God is the one who begins a relationship. Our God is the one that approaches the sheep. So we we see all that. Christ and Christ alone uh, wants a a true relationship with you. He is not in it for what he can gain, but he is in it for what he can give to you. All of us have been involved in relationships, maybe, maybe actual relationships or maybe business relationships or maybe some other form of relationship where someone was in that relationship only for what they could gain. But that's not the way Jesus Christ operates. He's not, he's not all about what he can gain. He's about what he can give to you. He is our gain. And so, so we see this. Now, I want to share something with you about sheep. It just seems so beautiful in our minds for Jesus to call us sheep. We're kind of impressed with that until we've ever been around a sheep. Uh, a sheep have some, uh, some great deficiencies. And I'd like to give you one. First, sheep are defenseless. You'll never hear somebody say they were uh, in the barnyard and they seen a sheep beat up a dog. Or they seen the sheep uh, uh, you know, run off a coyote. Sheep are defenseless. And also, sheep have a very poor sense of direction. Sheep are constantly getting lost without the guidance of the shepherd. The sheep will be in the flock, but they're always stepping away from the flock. They'll see a a, a wad of grass, or they'll see a bush that draws their attention, and away from the safety of the shepherd they go. The shepherd is constantly having to gather up the sheep. And then on top of that, uh, sheep do not recognize uh, things that are 
are to their own benefit. A, a flock of sheep will literally eat a field down to dirt when all they would have to do is move 15 or 20 yards and there would be grass knee deep. The shepherd has to move them. Now once again, the shepherd doesn't drive them. Jesus isn't driving you on this journey. You know, if he's driving you, then you don't know what's ahead. But he's leading you, which, which opens up the path ahead. As long as we see Jesus, we're safe. And, and that, that's where we're going. And, and so we see that. I, I have a passage I'd like to read at this time. Very familiar. I would imagine in your homes you have a, a, a napkin or a coffee cup or, or maybe a photo with this, uh, this uh, chapter. But Psalms 23, I'd say it's the most memorized. Uh, Psalm for sure. Uh, Any time that I commit a body to the ground uh, when I'm doing a funeral service, I always read Psalms 23. It's a very familiar passage, but, but I want you to read it. And I want you to focus with what we've given you so far, the background of Psalms 23. It simply says, the Lord is my shepherd. Notice the personal pronoun, my shepherd. The Lord isn't uh, necessarily uh, America's shepherd. He isn't necessarily the world's shepherd. It's an individual shepherd. He is our shepherd. We can claim him as our shepherd. And, and, and he, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Oh, he takes us from that, that dirt and rock. Uh, we would sit and eat the dirt and rock forever until we starve to death. But he takes us to much better. Many of you can tell that in your life. Maybe you were in a dead end. Maybe you were in a career or, or you were involved in something. And you would have stayed there. But through circumstance, God moved you. I wonder, I, I really do. I wonder maybe if many people will learn that Corona was, uh, w w was the object that the shepherd moved to move them on to something else. People are learning to work from home. People are spending more time with their family. People are learning what's valuable, what, what, what's meaning. Uh, the shepherd keeps us going. Uh, verse 4 says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Shadow of death is very humbling, isn't it? You ever take a glimpse of that shadow, it gives you chills. Uh, just a couple instances in my life that very quick events that afterwards I realized, ooh, that was, that was right at the shadow of death, but God in his mercy brought me through those. Just a couple times. But maybe there's somebody listening to me and you've got a sickness. And you don't just get a glimpse of the shadow. The shadow just kind of hanging over you. Uh, there's different circumstances for different people. But what happens when our shepherd takes us through the shadow of death? Look what it says. I will fear no evil. Why, why aren't we fearful? Because we know the shepherd is there. The shepherd cares. The shepherd loves. The shepherd guides. Uh, it's the shepherd. Uh, but look at what it says. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Uh, they were used for different things. The rod uh, had, had, had a, a hook on it, and it was used to bring the stray sheep in. It was used for the shepherd to find his way through rocky hilltops. But the staff, that was a whole different method. The staff was a defense mechanism. And we remember David, the shepherd, the young shepherd boy who fought the giant Goliath. And he said, God has prepared me for this Goliath because I have fought a lion and a bear. And they used their staff. The staff had a, a sharp end and it was like a, uh, they would stick and they would, they would fight back with it. And so, so God will guide us and direct us and bring us on a safe path. And then God will defend us. Our enemies can't defeat us when, when God has his staff. And, and we, we keep seeing this here. And it says, thou prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. If you serve Jesus Christ, somebody will come at you. Now, I don't think I have, I, I, personally, I don't feel like I have an enemy, but I have some people that may consider themselves my enemy. You see, it should never been on us, but sometimes it happens. If you serve Christ, you want to anger people. If you serve Christ, uh, if you're identified with Christ, those sheep that aren't in the fold, they're going to be jealous and they're going to be angry. And sometimes that's going to cause you feedback. 
But God says, I'll prepare a table. I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. Don't you worry about them. I'll get you through that. And then, then let's, let's look at the, uh, we see that he anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. I mean, God doesn't just bless us a little bit. He blesses us so we can't hold the blessings. Think, think about your home during this time. Uh, we, we found a whole nation that wasn't prepared even for a short two or three weeks. Uh, they didn't have things in their home. They didn't have things. And, and if, you, if you have those, I mean, think about the blessings of God. God's people should be prepared. The Bible tells us to be prepared. Uh, pulpits tell God's people to be prepared. Our blessings run over and let's continue here. And then surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Uh, this world is tough. It's difficult. It can be ugly. But goodness and mercy will follow the saints of God all their life. If you're, if you're, you're in the sheepfold of Jesus and he's your shepherd, then you have goodness and you have mercy that you can claim and that you can benefit from. And it does, it, not just for today. If God would bless you tomorrow, it'll be there tomorrow. If God bless you a month, it'll be there next month. If God blesses you 10 years, it'll be there next decade. I think you're getting the pattern. As long as you wake up, goodness and mercy are waking up with you. And so, so we see that. So, so uh, we see that. Now I want you to get back into John 10 and, and, and we, as we bring this message to a uh, little bit of a closure. And we're going to see something very interesting in verse 10. You see, uh, the ultimate uh, in care is that the shepherd will give his life for the sheep. The shepherd is going to give his life for the sheep. We know in past tense that happened. The crowd that Jesus was preaching to, it was a couple years away. But we see in verse 10... The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. Everything in your life is there to destroy you. You see, there's people telling you to walk away from Jesus. They have something much better for you. You know what they are? They're a thief. They're trying to steal your joy. Satan tells you that and he's trying to steal your soul. You see, everything in life that draws you away from Jesus is stealing what's best for you. None of us appreciate things being stolen. They're, they're, we all have those, our hit lists, so to speak. That's a terrible word for a pastor to use. But you know what I'm saying. Uh, there are just certain, certain things against humanity. By and, and it's always bothered me for someone to steal something someone else has worked for. You know, someone goes hard to work and they play by the rules and they purchase something only for somebody who wants to break the work rules, stealing. And, and that's what's going on here. You see, Jesus came and he, and he walked this earth. He breathed our air. He ate our food. He went to Calvary and died. He laid in a tomb for three days. And he came bursting out of that tomb alive. Jesus Christ paid the price. Jesus Christ did the work. And Satan and the flesh and the world... Try to steal that life from you that Jesus worked for while he was here. And that's what we're going to see. But, but, but let, let's look at the second part of 10. I, I, I love it. He says, I come that they might have life. Jesus came for a reason. He had a purpose. Everybody you know should have a purpose. I hope you have a purpose. I hope you have a work purpose. I hope you have a family person. I hope you have a life purpose. And Jesus did. Now look with me. Uh, uh, when he talks about life in, in Greek, that word life actually is zon. And zon is life of both physical and spiritual direction. Then uh, that makes that life more abundant. You see, Jesus said we have abundant life. We, for those redeemed saints of God, those in the sheepfold, those of Jesus' sheep, we have a better life than those that are without the sheepfold. And why is that? 
Because all of us, uh, the fact you're listening to this and the fact that you are, are, are tuned in, uh, whether you're here listening to us on the radio or you're tuned in in our, our, our YouTube video or maybe our Facebook live section or, or whatever format that you're viewing this sermon, uh, that, that proves you're alive. But there's people uh, that have that, that that aren't doing sermons. They're, they're doing something immoral or they're doing something criminal. But there's something separates the sheep from that crowd. And that, that we have an abundant life. We have another life. A life that many people don't focus on. And it's a spiritual life. You see, when Jesus died for us and we, we, we ask him to forgive us of our sins and we take him in to be Lord of our life, now we move, if you would, into this abundant life. We have life, physical life, plus we have spiritual life. And, and, and so we're seeing that. Now in verse 11, as we keep this going, we see the ultimate care. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Uh, the ultimate in care. You know, Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. Uh, he died so that you may live. Uh, oh, how he loves you and me, as the song says. Uh, he sure does. But I want you to look in verse 14 and 15, and it says, Jesus knows his sheep. He calls himself the good shepherd. I want you to take note. He did not call us the good sheep. He said he's the good shepherd. But how many of you know we aren't necessarily the good sheep? But in love and in care. And in verse 14 and 15 says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even now I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I want to talk to you here in closing. 2 Timothy 2.19 tells us the Lord knows the sheep that are his. Uh, the all-knowing God will not lose one sheep. He gave a parable where 99 sheep were safe, but one was wandering around in the brush. And the, and the shepherd left those 99 and went and found the one. 99, losing 1%. You know, there, there's uh, most of us, uh, especially farmers, uh, uh, turkey farmers, chicken farmers, uh, many farmers, uh, hog farmers, the uh, birth rate, nobody gets only loses one percent but Jesus wasn't willing even to lose that Jesus is taking home 100 percent of his sheep and that's what he's telling us here matter of fact Isaiah 49 15 says can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb surely they may forget Yet I will not forget you. Jesus said there's more chance of your mother forgetting that she gave you birth than for him to forget who you are. What a beautiful promise. But Jesus went on in closing this message. Jesus went on to say that he continues to grow his flock. And verse 16 and 18 he says, And other sheep I have that are not of this fold. There's more sheep. Jesus is still gaining sheep. Every waking hour, Jesus gains more sheep into the fold. Oh, how the herd is growing. But he gains them one by one, calling them a name. And, and the sheep hearing is the call, and the sheep responding to the call, and the sheep coming into the fold. Uh, perhaps you uh, that are tuned in, perhaps you recognize you're not a sheep. All you understand, you're pro-Jesus. And if you had a choice, you would say you believe in God. And you would even say you believe in Jesus. But yet, you've got to be honest. You've never really heard his voice. you never really followed his call. You're, you're living independent. Uh, matter of fact, the last thing you want to do is follow Jesus. Because he may ask you to do something that you don't want to do. That doesn't sound like one of his sheep to me. Using this passage as a demonstration, I think Bible makes plain. Scripture is our God, and Scripture says if you're Christ's sheep, you will follow Christ's call. And so uh, we'll see that. So I want to ask you that are tuned in uh, right now, maybe you, maybe you know for a fact that you're not 
one of Christ's sheep. What will you yield to that call today? Have you heard that call during the sermon? Have you heard Jesus say, I want you to be one of my sheep? He does. I, I know, remember, Jesus said he was the good shepherd, but he didn't say you're a good sheep. I know you got a lot of sins. I got a lot of sins. We all have a lot of sins. I know you just can't get past it. it you're still stumbling over the same rock. I don't know why that is. Uh, I'm an aged man, and I still stumble over the same things that I seem to always have stumbled over. But yet, God knows me. He knows me by name. He knows who I am. And he continues to work with me only because of his goodness and his grace. Uh, you know, t to know someone deep and know someone sincere and still work with them through their failures reveals you love that person. And Jesus loves you. And so... Uh, he says in John 7, 37, 38, If anyone thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of their belly will flow rivers of living water. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to have a prayer. And if you're listening to me and, and you can safely, if you're in your car, obviously you can't safely do this. Maybe pull off or maybe as soon as you can. But if you're in your living room or you're in somewhere where you can safely, I just want, would ask that you bow your head with me. So right now, let's just all bow our heads. Jesus, you're calling someone. There's someone listening to us in one of the, the medias that we're using for this sermon. And they're hearing you, and they, they, they want to be a sheep. And so, Father, uh, we just ask for that person to say, Father, I'm a sinner. Father, I have failed miserably. Father, I know I'm not a good sheep, but, Father, I know it's not on my goodness that I must trust. It's the good shepherd. So, Father, I ask now as I pray as the good shepherd that you would bring me into your sheepfold and you make me one of your sheep and, and help me to follow your, your life. And hear your voice. Father, we know that uh, our nation right now needs prayer. And we ask right now as we pray that you would intervene on behalf of the United States of America as well as the world. And you would put this virus at bay and bring our churches back together. Uh, Lord, we ask that whatever is accomplished and more indeed, it would be to your son's glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.